record. So now we're, we're officially doing it. Hi, everyone. If you're here on my Hello. channel, you, you probably know who I am, but I'm Jennifer from Insert Literary Fun here. And this is Kendra Winchester and Matthew Sharapa. They've named their channels after their names. Also, I apologize to anyone hearing Dylan like munch on his toy per usual. If, you're, if you know my channel, that's typically what happens. So we're just going to like roll with it. But um, and I'll, just hold up. I'll distract you with this like, look, look at the beautiful book. As part of Women in Translation Month every August for the past few years, we run a week long readathon themed around women in translation. And this year, for the first time, we decided to have a group book that we read that week. So we chose the very short and very intriguing Minor Detail by Adani Ishibli. <laughs> Translated from Arabic by Elizabeth Jacquet. We intend to potentially discuss spoilers. I don't think that this is a book that you can really spoil, um, except for the very ending. So we, we're going to get into specifics. If people don't want to know anything going in, which is how I was when I was starting, this is not going to be a video you want to watch until you've read it. I am curious, just to start, what you guys thought overall, like your initial general impressions of the book. Given that this was part of the Booker International long list this year and thinking about what that list was and what else was on it, I assumed that this was going to be possibly like very experimental. I went in thinking like, is this gonna be some sort of like nonfiction fiction hybrid? And I think like with those expectations, I was met with a book that I was comfortable with and didn't have to like come to. Um, in a dramatic way. I enjoyed a lot of what it did. I enjoyed my reading experience. It was very uh, swift. It wasn't like my favorite read. I don't know if I would like actively recommend it to anyone. I'm not disappointed that I read it. It did what it did and I was there and then I was not there. So I re read this book after reading uh, several titles for Reading Women's a Theme on Palestine, um, which Samaya, um, was led led the charge for lack of a better term on and she has a lot of great resources about it so I felt like going into this I had a bit more of context having just read all of these books about what was going on and I felt like that definitely helped me because if I hadn't read those books I wouldn't know that the way that she keeps referring to maps in the book is important because having an Israeli map and a Palestinian map is a, is a big deal like because that explains that you know the names are different and how colonization has worked in the region and so on and so forth. And so I feel like also as someone who's reading this in translation, I kept thinking like, I feel like if you read this in Arabic, you're probably more familiar with like the heritage of Arabic, you know, Palestinian traditional writing and you'd have much more context, but reading it in English, I feel like unless you were familiar with all of these details, you would miss out on some of the context so it more thought of like for me while I enjoyed it I wondered if there was a way we could have more maybe more footnotes for English readers um, any sort of context or background the author might want to add for English readers or something like that because otherwise I feel like a lot of the book or, or novella you're gonna you're gonna miss out on I think I disagree with both of you which is very interesting <laughs> to me. Um, so I really liked this book. I don't know much about uh, the occupation of Palestine um, or the, the politics between Israel and Palestine, but I felt like the book did a really good job of signaling um, even to readers who aren't so aware of the situation, of the feeling of the situation for somebody living under occupation. I didn't enjoy the reading experience of this book. It took me four days to read a 100 page book and I made myself read 60 pages on the last day. <laughs> it's, um, but I think that's partially because of something that I think it does really successfully is um, how grim it is. Uh, of course the subject matter is grim, but I think it's also exploring the grimness on the line level and a sort of austerity on the line level. Um, I think it goes beyond like sparseness almost. I, I really like the craft of this book. I didn't read the blurbs or the flap before I finished the book. I didn't want to know anything about what other people were saying about it. And when I saw J.M. Katsia's name at the top of the blurb on the back of the book, 
it like hit me. What this reminded me of more than anything is J.M. Katsia's writing. So we can get more into that as we go along. I feel like I fall in between, like in the middle of the road, maybe um, in that, you know, this is a novella, right? It, it can only do so much. And I wonder also for me, I wonder what, are the, what I'm missing from the Arabic language context, right? So when I read a book, I'm always aware of the literary traditions it's a part of, or if it's part of anything. I love context and the history and all of that. So for me, that's the questions that I had. Um, but also I want to be very clear and that I don't expect this book to educate me in a certain way, right? That's not its job, right? It's a we work of literature, it's being put out there, it's a story. And I think it's a very vital story. Maybe what I'm what I'm trying to say and this thing is that I really wanted more. I really wanted more of, of like what was going on with this contemporary person in particular. I wanted to know more about this person's story. This is a novella and it stands on its own. So I want to judge it on that. But me as a reader, as someone coming to this and enjoying the story, um, I really enjoyed the second part, I think, is really where this book for me shined, is in the second part of it. Um, there's been some commentary on the differences between the sections and the significance of that, but I'm trying to like just talk as a reader, if that makes sense. Well, um, I, I yeah. think like a triumph of this book's translation is the difference between the first and second mm -hmm. parts. Like I like if I'm going to like talk about what my favorite part of the reading experience is, it's the drastic contrast where this first section is so devoid of humanity. It is full of repetition. Its metaphors are obtuse. It's, you know, sections, uh, the, the section just, it, it's so lifeless and practical. And I think it makes the horrors that you see as a reader in those sections all the more devastating and vile because they are just so plainly spoken. And then to jump from that very mechanical structure to the second part of this book, which is just so imbued with humanity, that is so lively, that is so full of opinion and perspective and nuance. Um, I think like that is a testament to the success of the translator, probably of the author too. I'm assuming that didn't come from like thin air, you know, um, but also I think is what makes this book kind of special in its very compact way. When humanity gets in the way of like research, there's like an interesting metaphor that can happen. Like I feel like our character in the second part is unable to understand what happens in that first part because she's too busy with herself and her own experiences because that's what humans do. To what Kendra was saying that like, this is a book that kind of does toe that line between a, a nonfiction feel or a book about research. So your brain, I think, tricks into wanting scope, into wanting more history, into wanting uh, an explanation or even education because that's what the, main character of the second part is seeking. I think one of the things I enjoyed about it so much was um, that explicit feeling of knowledge being withheld from me and her so specifically choosing almost page by page what amount of knowledge and what amount of context she wanted to give you. And like you said, in the first section, there's, a, there's like pretty much no context as to what's going on, who this man is, like what his goal is who his enemies are, why are they his enemies, uh, like what time frame this is happening in, where exactly we're located geographically. I also appreciated exactly how you said it, Matthew, like that it's both meandering and compact and intense. And I don't quite know like how it manages to be both at the same time. This is why it reminded me so much. Have you guys read anything by J.M. Katsia? No. Mm -mm. Okay, so I've read um, Disgrace, which is kind of his book that I would recommend to most people. The book that this most reminded me of is called Waiting for the Barbarians, which was published in 1980, I think. And for those of you who might not be familiar with Kutsia, he's a South African writer who's a, won the Nobel Prize in literature. Um, and basically, Waiting for the Barbarians is this allegorical novel about colonialism. It's kind of like a, a meta book where the book itself is so impenetrable because so much of the book is about impenetrability. And that whole vibe of the first section in here is like he, it, it's kind of what you were getting at Matthew that we're in this man's body, but we're not in his head. Like we're seeing through his eyes sort of, um, but it's just like point, point by point what he does throughout the day and there's no nuance and there's no thought involved in it. The, the whole tone of that first section 
I think that's why I like couldn't read it like all the way through. Um, I could only read like 15 pages at a time and I felt so tense, um, but also bored, but also intrigued. <laughs> I, just like here, Liz, uh, the, cause he wa- like washes his hands or like washes himself. Mm-hmm. I, I forget the particular phrasing, but it happens more than once. And partially while reading it, I was like, wait, did I, did I already, did I like accidentally start on a different page? Like the wrong, did I read this twice? And the text did nothing to differentiate between the times that he did. So it's, you know, it, I could have been reading the same passage over and over again and not have realized it. Mm-hmm. And I think that's, it's just how rote everything was. I wonder if it's like in part to try to get at, you know, reading like a transcript from like a case study or like a file. You know, I, th- I wonder if it's about like removing humanity in that way that it's just like a strict reporting. And this is how many times he washed his hands. And this is when the dog walked by and like, I wonder if like that's part of the the choice to make it that way mm-hmm. where Jennifer, I feel like your interpretation was far more of a human choice. It, it seems like uh, a far more psychological choice uh, to put it in that perspective. Um, and I, I hadn't really considered it that way. I think that's how exactly how this man wants to be portrayed. And every single time that he washes up and goes through the same things, it's like he's resetting from like any emotions that he might be feeling. And he's like washing them all off himself. And that was my, my favorite moment of the book. Uh, obviously like, the book is playing with the idea of like details and what's important to certain people and what's not important to others. But my favorite moment is in the second half of the book when she goes to the Israeli military museum and she's just going through this whole list of objects that she sees there. And one of the things that she mentions is a shaving kit and like a bar of soap. And then she goes along and as soon as you see shaving kit and bar of soap there, you're like taken back to the 12,000 times that this man used a shaving kit and a bar of soap. And like, those were almost the protagonists of the first section of the book, right? And to you, they like <laughs> leap out and you're like, wow, like you don't even know how significant this shaving kit is because you weren't there. He has a he has a wound of some from what, is it a snake or bug or what, what bit him? And that's why he's like trying to clean the wound all the time. And it's kind of like this metaphor for his own um, how he just begins to almost lose his humanity over the course of time as this wound begins to fester in his body. And the more it festers, the more inhumane, like he begins to behave and, and things that he does and, and the decisions he makes are more and more horrific. And you're like, you know, it, it's like a, you know, this very obvious metaphor for like his heart rotting. Uh, in his body and like him trying to cleanse himself, like almost like Pontius Pilate, like trying to cleanse his hands, you know, of this like thing that he's doing, but obviously he can't. Like when he goes through his whole cleaning ritual and whatever, and the smell is still there. And then he realized, like he was thinking that it was like her smell that was rancid and that was like infecting the area. And then he realized it was coming from his own leg, (laughs) like that the call was coming from inside the house. Let's talk about the obvious, but the title of this book is called Minor Detail. Like it's like, it's it's so <laughs> it can a part of it was frustrating for me because you're what what is being done in that first section does feel obvious that what you fixate upon is going to be like what does it for you i mean the shaving kit and the soap yes an interesting commentary when it comes to unpacking history because even just what ch- people choose to study what the main character of the second part chooses to like research and find out about what is considered a minor detail. Is it like, is the rape of a woman in the grander scheme of history considered a minor detail? Well, who's writing that history and who's researching it? Like, I think like that, I, I, I couldn't decide whether or not I felt was like lovely and like really just solidly done. Or if I found it to be almost like trite, um, because of how solidly it was done? Hypothetically, if I went and, and tried to research an American minor detail, I would be able to do that, right? I would be able to go and like research the book, and like the book or the thing, the thing that I wanted to research, right? But the fact that Palestinian people have to go to great lengths just to learn more about their own history and that they do not have that privilege, I think was really hit home because I don't think a contemporary, like, I don't think speaking from American perspective, that most Americans realize what contemporary Palestinians have to go through just to research this, for example. And as you can tell, I, I think like 
whenever you fall with this book on the like, I'm not sure if it was successful. I tend to fall on like this, this was successful and here's why. But I think actually like for me, the, the area that detracted from it was just that the title of the book was minor detail, which I like as a title. I think it's a really successful title, but what happens with any title is that, you know, like the, the book consent by Annabelle Lyon that I read earlier this year, it's like whenever the word consent appeared in the, in the text, it was like the Leonardo DiCaprio meme, you know, <laughs> like there it is. There's the title. When I actually think that like kind of stripped of, of the title of the book, the times when it, it brought up this phrase, minor detail were like incredibly impactful to me. And I thought that they were really artistically done and like kind of not overdone in, in and of themselves. This gets to something psychological of like, why do any of us fixate on any specific tragedy necessarily? We're true crime podcasts. I don't listen to that many true crime podcasts, but I've like listened to a few while I've been like organizing my home recently. And it's like, there's one case that I cannot stop thinking about. And it's like, why? There's, there's no actual reason that that case is more significant. It's not actually objectively more haunting than anything else. Um, and I thought that the, the way that the phrase minor detail was was used was actually like really thought provoking um, in a way that I was worried that it would be kitschy. I love to consider books as a whole, including title, including like white space on the page. Like that's uh, how I enjoy my reading. So mm -hmm. like, I, you know, I think Jennifer pointing out that like that was the one thing that kind of like tipped it off as like not an amazing thing. Like that, I don't know if it like deeply affected my reading experience but you can't go into a book like this and not like start to draw conclusions immediately based on its title mm -hmm. um and maybe that's kind of a point maybe the point is to read this and see what you get distracted by um when you like think that you should be observing specific moments you know that's interesting we, we kind of just discussed this off camera that we are not going to get into the graphic detail of of the the terrible crime in this book um but I do think we can broadly discuss the, the artistic way that the author portrayed and, and generally portrays terrible things here. I have a very complicated feelings ab about the way that people write ab about trauma and like terrible traumatic experiences in books, whether it's from the perspective of the victim or the perpetrator. And I think I might just be a hypocrite where I enjoy certain things in classics that I like hate in contemporary literature, where I like love the gaudiness of like Greek poetry and drama, where it's just like, here's the exact anatomical like place that I was hit with the spear. And like, here's where the blood went. And like, here's how I felt about it, you know? Um, and I'm like, yes, like give it to me for 800 pages. But then you have a book like A Little Life, which I think to its credit, regardless of what you think of it, it's still a lightning rod. Even like um, R.F. Kong's The Poppy War, a, a first book in a fantasy trilogy, yeah. um, where like, I think like that sort of gaudiness is almost, it's almost like the gaze of the book in that instance is turned toward the reader more than it is turned toward the tragedy where you can like almost see the author like turning more to you and being like, how are you, how are you reacting? How are you feeling about this? So that the tragedy itself becomes like almost like the secondary figure in the interaction, you know? And I don't think that happened with this book. I was very interested in its mixture of graphic detail, but also restraint. Um, but I'm curious if you guys would agree with like the, those general thoughts about portraying violence and also how it was portrayed in this book. So much to unpack, Jennifer. Uh <laughs> I want you to know if you agree with those general thoughts about the portrayal of violence. Wow. Um, <laughs> do we have another hour to record? Um, no, uh, uh, I'll talk about this, this book specifically. I think the way, the way that it is depicted in the first part of this text is paired, and I think I mentioned this at the beginning, is paired with this kind of like mechanical rote writing style and for me it kind of made it all the more graphic um perhaps because i'm in uh, because because of the text being not vague sounds pejorative i don't mean it in this way um because it's vague i'm putting my personal feelings and experiences and opinions onto it and therefore it is 
a more empathetic experience because it is a more open-ended experience because the author doesn't go into graphic detail. Um, because the detail that is described is tonally squashed. It's not dramatized. It is very like mechanical. And so for me, that made it kind of all the more difficult to endure. I think that speaking to the examples that you gave, Jennifer, I the, the primary thing I disliked about that first book, uh, The Poppy War, was, was I think it went into too much detail. I feel like we did not we did not need that much detail to understand what was going on. We did not, I did not feel like that was a, for lack of a better term, like correct execution of how you could, could do that. But in, in this particular book, I, I felt like it was effective. Like I agree with Matthew in that I think it was the right choice. Now I thought it was more, I, I thought it was the correct choice for what she was trying to do. And for me, um, I think it worked because she did not give those excruciating details because she didn't have to. And I don't know how she would be able to write this without taking that very step back tone, you know, and that's the impression that I got was that's why that she was telling the story in this way, in this detached way, because this was one example of thousands that she could give. And what I thought the second section did was say each example is important. So when I like, you bring up a little life in terms of like it's it's graphic or like active depictions but like to me little life is an experiment in endurance like it is for both the reader to endure and for the characters to endure and like that is kind of what makes that book as much of a lightning rod as it is is it is I view it as an experiment and that's the word I will continue to use to describe that book maybe this is a little bit about what uh Kendra pointed towards is like you know, this this almost feels like like a coroner's report in a way. Like the 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 how much you know, if you were to pick up the file of this historical occurrence, like what you would really need detailed is what we got. Similar to a coroner's report, the most important testimony is missing, which is like the, yeah. the key feature of the book and a very obvious thing to point out. But I do I do think that the um the ghostly presence of of this woman um even even while she's alive in, in the first part of the book is was like very very intense for me and and I was thinking about her constantly the, the passage where she talks about like this is just one woman this is just one rave rave like that kind of like um that passage that happens is like one of the first parts of the second half so it's very it was very jarring to me um, to go from that first section to kind of that reflection on that first section, to then have it be so offhandedly referenced so immediately after, um, I thought that was incredibly effective. Um, I, I, I think the exuberance with which I'm talking about it I think speaks to its impact. Have you guys read The Ministry of Utmost Happiness by Arundhati Roy? No. I haven't. No. I I think that book is maligned on booktube i think it's really good and it kind of does the reverse of what this one does where it, well there's a, a section in the beginning about certain characters but then there's there's kind of a middle transition period where it looks at all these people all these different groups protesting various issues in one location um and then you focus in on one of those groups which is about the protesting the war in Kashmir. And then you follow the Kashmir storyline for most of the rest of the book. But you always have in the back of your mind that this is just like one, one of like the dozens of protesters that you met in that transition section. Um, and so it like kind of never escapes you the feeling that it's like, oh, this like, this feels like the most important thing in the world because that's what a book can do um, when it turns its attention to something. But like, if I heard about this, it would like, it would be noise, you know, it would be another thing, like another tragedy, another terrible, I don't know, another thing that that's worth caring about and fighting about. But am I going to fight for it? Am I going to care about it? There are, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of more examples of, you know, novellas like this that could be told, you know, of stories about Palestinians. And that's something that, that I thought about was like how, how this is deeply connected to contemporary Palestinian literature and like all the different stories being told. You know, Kendra, ever since you brought it up, it's kind of just like stuck in my head of like the privilege of being able to research a history. And I think of like people going to school to study like the most hyper specific two years of like 
just French, like just regional history, because that is, there is an abundance of um, information like accessible. Whereas like books that are published about Palestinian history are like, like Palestinian history. And like, that's the title where you'll get like, as opposed to like between the years of 1862 and 1864. I think we should talk about the ending. Um, she gets shot and like, what, like, it's a short book, it needed to end. I think that's a very efficient way to end a short book. However, like, I don't wanna just be like, what does it mean? But I mean, like, what does it say about futility? What does it say about inevitability? And, in you know, like, what does it say about violence against women? I think we were talked earlier about the maps, right? And how that the Israeli map, particularly ones they give to tourists, erased Palestinian history and Palestinian names of towns. They either renamed or wipe off the map. Like it's a whole part of cultural erasure that Palestinians experience. It's very real reality. So for me, I didn't think that this could end well um, for her because she is searching that history that she's not supposed to be searching according to the Israeli government. I mean, I was shocked by the abrupt ending and I was like very confused as we've talked off off camera because I was like, wait, did this happen? Like, this is very abrupt. But like, I didn't expect it. I didn't think she would be coming home like when she left. I feel like her point was made. Was it clumsy maybe or not? I, I, I'm not sure if it was or not. I was a much worse reader than both of you in this respect and that I fell into the nothing bad will happen to the first person narrator feeling. Um, and I also think because I don't live in an occupied territory, um, I had what I look back on because of the ending, I look back on and I, I recognize this completely irrational thoughts where Whenever she was driving up to a checkpoint and she was very, very nervous about it, I thought you shouldn't worry so much because you're the protagonist and you're going to get through the checkpoint. And if you don't, you're going to survive because you need to tell us about what happens while you're at the checkpoint. Um, and, and so I think like, again, that was like just a very like, I am safe here as I'm reading this book and I live in like general safety and things are going to be okay for you probably um, because bad things happen to the, the people who were secondary characters in the third person narratives, right? Um, and so the end of the book actually, like, she probably constructed it like just for readers, <laughs> readers like me <laughs> who are thinking that way and who don't, who aren't being as sensitive as, as you were Kendra to like the actual reality of the, the dangers, like regardless of who this person is or like how she functions for you, the reader. I am very curious about like it's metatextual intentionality. Like I'm very curious about how much this was like, okay, book's over. Let's talk about the real world now. <laughs> um, because you don't get to follow this character in a fictional story anymore. Like, I wonder how much of it was like that actually intentioned. Well, thank you for hopping on this Zoom and by extension hopping on my channel, Matthew and Kendra, to discuss Absolutely. this book. This, this particular Women in Translation Month was difficult just given the world's circumstances. Um, and, you know, I had a great time regardless. <laughs> I was so grateful for Women in Translation Month this year. I mean, I could, I could say that with all sincerity every year. Like, it's so great. But it like, actually, I just, I couldn't read before the month of August. I really couldn't. Um, and something about, I don't know, like this book and, and others just like really, really, uh, what, what's the, I was going to say juiced up the gears juice me up the grease the gears <laughs> i'll just cut that part out <laughs> no keep it keep it you have to